Welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. My name is Alexander Scott. I am your host and outreach coordinator here at Latin American Perspectives. Before we start this episode, I am excited to announce that our podcasts are now available on a number of podcast listening apps, including Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. So please subscribe to the Latin American Perspectives podcast on your preferred podcast app so you can receive updates and notifications about our new episodes. Today, we have a very interesting and thought-provoking podcast for you with LAP Coordinating Editor Dr. Christy Wilson. Christy is a coordinating editor here at Latin American Perspectives, as well as an associate professor of rhetoric and composition and the director of the writing program at Soka University of America in Aliso Viejo, California. She is author of many publications and the co-editor of the books Italian Neorealism and Global Cinema, published by Wayne State University Press in 2007, and the book Film and Genocide, published by the University of Wisconsin Press in 2012. Last week, I met up with Christy at Soka University of America, where we discussed the new LAP issue she recently edited, titled Politics, Society, and Culture in Post-Conflict Peru. This episode was quite fun to record, as I have a serious affection for Peru and an interest in Peruvian history and politics. As a graduate of Soka University of America, I have known Christy for quite some time and consider her a really good friend, for she's been a really great support and resource in my professional and academic life. Now, this issue of LAP and my conversation with Christy focus on political, economic, and social issues within Peru that have really taken place in the past 20 years or so. That being said, a basic knowledge of Peruvian history is pretty key for understanding more recent issues and events. So before I play the interview, I felt it was important to provide some background information on the history that led to the internal conflict period of the 1980s and 90s using excerpts from Christie's introduction to the issue. The most recent military dictatorship in Peru began in 1968 and ended in 1980. Inspired by the Cuban Revolution and led by combative trade unions, progressive forces were on the rise in Peru in the late 1960s. In October 1968, General Juan Velasco Alvarado ushered in a bloodless coup, assumed the presidency, and dissolved Peru's National Congress. Faced with the abject failure of the country's traditional political parties, Peru's military responded by instituting an unusual reformist dictatorship that carried out agrarian reform and nationalization of key export industries. General Alvarado's military-dominated administration was committed to a participatory, cooperative-based model that came to be known as the Inca Plan. The Inca Plan was organized as a social proprietorship in which enterprises, be they industrial, commercial, agricultural, were to be managed collectively and owned either by the state or by the workers. As a result, the Peruvian left splintered over how to respond to the military's reforms. Recognizing the regime's social democratic politics, some progressives decided to work within its institutions to push the reforms forward. Others, however, continued organizing independently, built a broad left coalition, and pursued the restitution of electoral democracy. During this time, Maoist groups gained a significant following among Peruvian university students, and one Maoist faction in particular, organized as a cult around the provincial college professor Abimael Guzman, or Presidente Gonzalo, and opted to oppose the reestablishment of electoral democracy by launching a rural-based armed struggle in the name of the Sendero Luminoso, or the Shining Path. Initially, Sendero Luminoso was largely confined to academic circles and Peruvian universities, but during the late 1970s, the movement developed into a guerrilla group and gained support from campesino communities in the Ayacucho region. While Peru's left-led coalition initially won important electoral positions in Congress in the 80s, traditional parties retained control of the presidency, with the attendant ineffectiveness and corruption. At the same time, Shining Path increasingly resorted to terrorism to build its base, coercing indigenous communities to provide recruits under the threat of death and indoctrinating their members. When the limits of their organizing were reached in the countryside, Shining Path carried its tactics to the urban shanty towns, some of which were already well organized by progressive political groups. 
Meanwhile, conservative media fomented a reactionary backlash against, quote, terrorism in public opinion, particularly in the middle and upper classes, but also in many vulnerable populations. With the return to civilian government in 1980, a decade of continued violence began, and with it, a period of deep economic instability. The Shining Path launched an armed struggle against the state, and in 1982, a different guerrilla organization, the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement, began its own series of armed actions. During this time, Peru became one of the most violent countries in the world, and would remain so until the 1990s. In 1990, Alberto Fujimori, an ambitious university administrator, emerged victorious in the country's presidential election. Fujimori unleashed the military and police in a dirty counterinsurgency war, not only against the Shining Path, but also against other dissident groups, whether they were actually real or imagined. Fujimori's use of state violence was successful in defeating the armed insurgencies, and his administration saw a type of economic prosperity. But this was accomplished in part by the dissolution of Congress and the suspension of the Constitution in 1992 as well as the use of austerity measures and rule by decree. Largely, Fujimori garnered high levels of popular support in the country, but the elite pact that facilitated developmentalism's descent into neoliberalism came at a high price. His government was characterized by authoritarianism, repression of opposition forces, and high levels of corruption across all spheres of public life. In 2000, fleeing an impending indictment and impeachment, he traveled to Japan, where he resigned his presidency and remained in exile until 2007. While visiting Chile in 2007, he was extradited by the Peruvian government and faced charges of human rights abuses and corruption. In 2009, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And a variety of other events have happened since in regards to Fujimori. But now that you have that context, I'll go ahead and play the interview with Christy Wilson. I hope you enjoy it. Christy, welcome to the Latin American Perspectives Podcast. Thanks, Alex. Have you ever done a podcast before? This is my first podcast. Oh, cool. I'm looking forward to it then. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of the issue, can you briefly describe for our listeners the main theme of the issue and how it came about? Yes. The theme of this issue is post-conflict Peru. And I'll tell you what that term means in a minute, but I, I just want to say that this issue is very much um, the result of working collaboratively at LAP. I am the issue editor, but I took on the issue when another editor dropped out and I got a lot of assistance from Steve Elner and William Bollinger from the LAP Collective. So I really want to say thank you to them for their help. The issue focuses on this term uh, post-conflict and what that means in the Peruvian context is the period from the time when President Alberto Fujimori resigned from the presidency in 2000 up to the present. So the essays in this collection challenge a popular de depiction of Peru as a bright example of post-conflict reconstruction. In 2001, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission investigated atrocities committed between 1980 and 2000. This period is referred to as the internal armed conflict. And during this period, Peru saw state-sponsored violence, violence from Sendero Luminoso actions, and also from the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement actions. The internal armed conflict and the violence from it resulted in a combination of actors that committed acts of extreme political violence and human rights abuses including sexual violence against women, coerced sterilizations of indigenous women uh, is just one example of that, torture, disappearance, massacres, and extrajudicial executions. So during this period, Peru became one of the most violent countries in the world. The official Truth and Reconciliation Commission numbers put the death toll from the conflict at about 69,000 with thousands more unaccounted for in that number. Uh, they might have been displaced, disappeared, undocumented, etc. Fujimori's 10-year administration coincided with Peru's involvement with the international drug trade as well. 
and is characterized by its authoritarian, vertical approach to the democratic process. Anibal Quijano argues that Fujimorismo, as it's called, is an approach that was characterized by uh, coalition politics between speculative capital, prominent members of the armed forces, a throwback to the dictatorship years, and techno-bureaucrats. As Quijano suggests, Fujimorismo had, quote, fascist traits, but lacked the nationalist discourse and the mythology, end of quote, to be considered a mass movement. So some of the themes in the post-conflict context that you asked about in this issue consider the Peruvian socio-political landscape in the wake of Fujimorismo. This landscape is characterized by all sorts of things, but uh, just to name a few, extractivist economies and their impact on indigenous communities, inequality, especially among Peruvian indigenous communities, post-conflict development programs and initiatives, reparation programs, family planning programs, incarceration, children and activism, the relationship between uh, indigenous communities and the state, among other themes. So as you're saying, this issue focuses on the post-conflict period after ex-president Fujimori went to exile in Japan and his subsequent impeachment in 2000. Mm-hmm. With respect to the issue, could you highlight any articles? Definitely. And that will tell you a little bit about what's been going on in these post-conflict years from Fujimori's resignation to the present day. Um, yeah, so I guess I would start with um, a piece by Alberto Veraga and Aaron Watanabe called Presidents Without Roots, Understanding the Peruvian Paradox. So what these authors talk about is Fujimori's authoritarian approach to democracy and ways in which his legacy has expanded to account for a neoliberal, democratic, technocratic political context in the post-conflict years. And there's another piece that kind of complements this piece by Jerónimo Rios called Narratives About Political Violence and Reconciliation in Peru. And what he did was engage with a variety of survivors of the political violence in civil society in Peru. And these are people from all of the different sectors. So members of the Sendero Luminoso, of the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement, members of the armed forces, indigenous community members, everyday Peruvians not involved in any of those sectors. And he interviewed them over a period of years in an attempt to understand why, in his view, um, Peru is still such a polarized society. Um, some two day, decades after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And what he found is that uh, a lot of people are still waiting for reparations to come through. They still have pending cases. Uh, there is no real sense of closure or actual reconciliation among groups. Another piece that I like a lot in this issue is called Doing Politics Differently, Middle Class Youth and Politics in Contemporary Lima. And this is by an author named Franca Winter. She's looking at a demographic in Peru that is educated and politically active, but deeply distrustful of traditional politics in the wake of Fujimori's style of politics. So what she concludes is there's widespread disdain among the middle class youth for standard politics. Young people are holding, you know, incredibly strong political values and ideas for change, but they don't actually believe that they can make that happen in the traditional structure of Peruvian politics. And I think this is something that we're seeing all over the world. You know, young people who want to participate in politics, who don't any longer believe in the stability of traditional forms of democracy and are kind of left to to figure it out. So... Picking up on that theme of younger generations, there's another uh, is, there's another essay in the collection by Jessica K. Taft called Continually Redefining Protagonismo, the Peruvian Movement of Working Children and Political Change between 1976 and 2015. So this is a really long study, but she's looking at a longstanding network of approximately 10,000 poor and working class children between the ages of eight and 17 who 
hold regular democratic meetings and elect delegates to participate in regional and national activities and to serve on committees, kind of like model, model UN. Um, this movement encourages youth participation in community politics and presents a theoretical challenge to Fujimorismo in terms of Fujimorismo's top-down neoliberalism. So she's arguing that these delegations and groups of children working together in kind of a government setting is going to ensure the radical inclusion of working children's perspectives and their rights in everyday decision-making and policy-making. So this piece is interesting, too, and kind of resonates also with our uh, our immediate con- global context of the climate strikes, which just happened this weekend, right? So we all saw the power of children working together across social media, and they have obviously an incredible leader in Greta Thunberg, who's a very articulate speaker and very organized. So um, there's a lot of, I think, hope in some of the essays for younger generations to be able to work together and perhaps, you know, impact politics. But there's also deep skepticism about Fujimori's legacy in Peru. So he's celebrated as being someone who brought an end to the the shining path, brought an end to the drug war, et cetera, et cetera, ensured a kind of economic stability in Peru. But our essays in this, in this issue poke holes in that beautiful picture by looking at ways in which democracy has been kind of gutted out. So this is the the wake of a gutting of democracy and an increased reliance on neoliberal market-based strategies. And then all the people that get left out of that and the way in which that creates ever growing inequality, you know, wealth gaps. Another thing we're seeing all over the world, unfortunately. <laughs> It's interested in the last essay in mm-hmm. the in the issue is a photo essay, yes. and I found that one really interesting. Mm-hmm. So I was hoping you could talk about that as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So we're really lucky. We don't normally publish photo essays, but we were so fortunate to have this contribution by um, internationally renowned photojournalist Anibal Martel, and this photo essay is about Peru's largest prison. It's located 10 kilometers outside of Lima, and it's, it's the prison in San Juan de Lurigancho. This was a prison that was at one time considered to be the most dangerous prison in the world. And it's uh, infamous for its overcrowding. And so the photo essay, I, in my view, presents a really compassionate view of life inside the prison in a series of photos. A lot of the photos are incredibly difficult to look at because there are people with drug addiction problems, physical deformities, suffering in all stages of life. Uh, And the prison is very clearly overcrowded. Um, There are too many people in each cell. Some of the photos, um, in fact, the cover photo registers that very well. Living conditions in this prison are horrendous. But the photo essay itself presents, I think, a hopeful visual message because it shows people working together to lead more dignified lives inside the prison. The inmates have actually organized into support teams to help each other. So one of the pictures shows a central market inside the prison where people can exchange goods, buy food, etc. It shows people working together when they've received packages from loved ones from the outside. It shows people helping others with just their physical needs, getting around and quite a lot of camaraderie in the photo essay. So I think it's a really beautiful essay about a very difficult topic. And we're very fortunate to have it. I think LAP readers will will enjoy it. Yeah, I'd like to see more photo essays in the issues in the future. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we're really lucky to have such a high quality photo essay for this issue. And the cover photo is is from the photo essay as well. Well, that's all the time we have. But uh, thank you so much for meeting with me. Thank you. This podcast. That was great. Thanks, Alex. Well, folks, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed listening to our conversation, check out our most recent issue online at latinamericanperspectives.com. And if you enjoy listening to our podcasts and have an interest in learning more about current events and general political economy in Latin America, please consider subscribing to our journal at latinamericanperspectives.com. 
On that note, I want to say thank you for listening in. And don't forget to add us on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and all our other social media sites. And also, please share this podcast with your like-minded colleagues, comrades, and compañeros. We'll be back in November for our next podcast. Hasta luego. Hasta luego.